Are you ready, kids? Aye, aye, Captain. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I hope we all had a very good uh, summer. We survived another one, I guess. The pandemic does appear to be winding down. I'm just here, chilling, enjoying a ye old bottle of rum. Summer's almost over, but as you all know, it's maybe looking at the history of this channel thus far. I don't have a lot of content out. That did not stop me from get, wanting to get in on a little bit of a trend. Nando V Movies currently has issued a challenge to all the YouTubers. Me hearties. And that challenge is, I think, something that we've all been kind of fascinated with, and that is villains. So villains have always been very popular. We've always been of great interest. Many have been overdone and memed to death, and we could see less of them, to be honest. But every villain has their value. You know, a good story of heroics is defined by its villain, by its antagonist. And in life, we're only as good as the people we define ourselves in opposition to, for good or for ill. Most villains don't believe they're a villain. I think we all kind of think we are the hero of our own story, to some extent or another. I think most human beings don't think they are bad or doing bad things. Does my makeup look like shit? Oh yes it does! Yes! New to YouTube and new to this. So, since the topic of the day is villains, I thought I would just sit down and force y'all to listen to me rant about a very small part of a thing that has been dominating my life in this pandemic world so you can know about it and you can go consume it and maybe I find some peace. This get up will make sense momentarily. I think everybody is kind of at one point in their life had a bit of a fascination with pirates and I certainly did. Yes it was mostly because of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies but that at least inspired me to go out and look at the actual history of our idea of pirates of 18th century thieves and buccaneers of the high seas who they were because they have become very iconic in our pop culture, but I think a lot of people don't really know a lot about them. Which brings me to today's PowerPoint presentation. So if you haven't seen Black Sails, I mean, I mean, what are you doing with yourself? I mean, it is a show I think a lot of people have been sleeping on. And I mean, in fairness, I don't know where exactly you can stream it legally. But on the other hand, we are pirates! We don't even know what that means! So, to summarize, Black Sails was a series which ran for four seasons on Stars Network. Broadly speaking, it is the story of Captain Flint, the infamous fictional pirate in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. But even more broadly, it is about the real-life historical Pirate Republic, which briefly existed in Nassau in the Bahamas in the early 18th century. It is, however, heavily fictionalized. Black Sails doesn't let history get in the way of a good story, nor does it even let the canon of Treasure Island get in the way of a good story. The result is a piece of intensely character-driven and also politically savvy historical fiction. It is primarily motivated by Flint's personal war against the British Empire and the forces of colonial civilization. And I could say more than that, but would we would be here for so long. I have so much to say on this story. If you would like a pretty comprehensive summary of what's so great about Black Sails, I really recommend you go watch Rowan Ellis's video on the subject. It's really good. But even that, like as someone who's watched the show multiple times, I just still feel there's so much to talk about. I know there is a podcast called Fathoms Deep, which goes into more detail. But even then, this show has layers and such good character writing that it is so interesting to talk about. And see, in contrast to something like Game of Thrones, that was a show that liked to bill itself as being, you know, so fucking real and political. But let's be real. It was mostly just the rape and slaughter sideshow with the most expensive sets in town that could afford Oscar-winning actors. Game of Thrones was trash. I should admit that. However, I'm not trying to qualify 
the quality of black sales by bashing game of thrones but it is interesting these are two shows that were airing around the same time one was a gigantic cultural phenomenon and i don't think it deserved it as much as the other i think we all realize eventually how immature and actually pretty uncritical game of thrones was pretty far into in its run especially after they ran out of books to adapt we especially realized it you know by that ending how little self-awareness it had about critiquing systems of power just at the end of the show just crowned the milk toast psychic in a wheelchair king great <laughs> and to be fair black sales by no means is free from the exploitative tv trashiness that was typical of prestige tv which wasn't always justified particularly in its earlier season but it was a show that quickly became unlike its contemporaries in that it actually had something very meaningful to say and a cast of characters who were complex and morally nuanced enough to support not just the entertainment but the socially relevant discourse that the writers wanted to communicate black sales is a really good show and i feel like it deserved more fans than it than it had and has go watch it i don't know where exactly i think it's it's on Crave TV. I don't know if anyone has Crave TV, but on the other hand, piracy. It's appropriate. <laughs> anyway, to make a very long story short of summing up what is relevant to talk about the scene I want to discuss for this video. Make a very long story story. <laughs> story short? Story start. Story short. By the fourth season in the show, the pirates of Nassau, including the fictional Long John Silver from Treasure Island, the real life but heavily fictionalized Jack Rackham, Anne Bonny, and Edward Teach, better known as Blackbeard, have joined forces to declare open rebellion on the British with the aim of reclaiming the town of Nassau and then possibly liberate the entire new world. This is all following the execution of their mutual friend, fellow pirate Charles Vane, also based on a real person. Leading the vanguard of the British forces sent to reestablish colonial rule is our villain, a fictionalized version of the real life former privateer and governor of Nassau, Woods Rogers. See, throughout the series, we echo a theme of marginalization as it pertains to so-called civilization. Captain Flint first states that in branding those outside the British law, outside the empire, outside society, pirates, they seek to paint the pirates or criminals, anyone who is in opposition to society, as monsters, something contemptuous of the so-called goodness of polite society, something unnatural and subhuman. And it becomes clear that those who have been shunned by society have a common cause with the pirates, victims of the slave trade, sex workers, queer people. Albeit, I don't think there's sufficient queer representation in this. That's a whole other topic. All these people eventually find themselves in opposition to colonization and in a league with the pirates. And this makes Woods Rogers the ideal villain for the series. He is presented as a dark mirror to Flint. They're both single-minded and voracious tacticians. They also have a bit of a blind spot for the feelings and autonomy of others. The difference is their legitimacy. The difference is that the society that Woods Rogers comes from validates his behavior, validates his cruelty and his single-mindedness and his goals, his identity as a white man. Flint is excluded from this having been disgraced as a queer man. Not only that, but Rogers represents the physical impending threat of imperial retaliation, which had been looming since the first season. But also ideologically, he and his allies embody the themes of brutality and hypocrisy of spreading civilization that have been brought up again and again. No more so is that made more clear than in season four, and in particular, the scene in question. The scene in question is a climactic confrontation that I believe represents the naked idea ideology of Rogers, not just as a person, but as a force of colonialism. But it also bears the shortcomings of both of those things. I do need to warn everybody, there's a severe content warning, though I will try to censor as much of it as I can. Anyone who seeks out this show, fair warning that the scene in question is one of the most horrific and emotionally harrowing scenes I have ever witnessed in a television series. When season four begins, Flint's alliance of pirates is now in open rebellion against the British garrison 
led by Woods Rogers at Nassau. After a miserable failed assault to retake Nassau, Rackham, Bonnie, and Teach, who avoided the ambush in the bay, return to blockade Nassau in order to ransom Eleanor Guthrie. Eleanor is one of our leads who was previously the acting governor of Nassau in all but name, until she was betrayed by the other pirates, including Flint and her ex-boyfriend, Charles Vane, leading to her being arrested by the British. Woods Rogers, however, offered to spare her from the gallows in exchange for helping to retake the island from the pirates for the crown. To make a very long story short, Eleanor and Rogers ended up married and re-establishing rule over Nassau. I am going to say Nassau a lot in this video. <laughs> Season 3 culminated with Charles Vane being hanged by Rogers, but this inadvertently galvanized many of the pirates of Nassau to join forces with Flint. Rackham and Bonnie were previously part of Vane's crew, and though they frequently clashed, had a deep, almost familial bond to Charles. Likewise, Edward Teach is implied to have raised Charles and saw him as a protege and a kind of adopted son, compounded by the fact that Blackbeard had never had any children of his own and worried after his legacy whilst pondering his inevitable death. In season four, Jack and Teach, despite the friction between their two personalities manage to find common ground in their desire to avenge Charles. But later, they are also in an agreement that revenge on Eleanor would not be as meaningful as ridding their island of Rogers and the British. Did we get all that? <laughs> It's a lot, and it's not even all of it. I am summing up. At this point, the audience is led astray in the same way Rackham, Teach, and Eleanor are. At first, we believe Rogers is planning to divert the pirates from the bay so Eleanor can escape. But as we quickly see, pirates are being led into a trap where Rogers can finish the pirates once and for all. This culminates in Blackbeard being lured onto Rogers' ship where his men are overpowered by a surprise attack from Rogers, and Jack is given no choice but to surrender. And here is where our scene unfolds. I will show them what the consequences are for threatening that which I hold most dear. I will leave no doubt about it. Do it. Shackled and assembled on the deck of the Queen Anne's Revenge, the pirates are forced to watch as their commander, their unofficial pirate king, is trussed up by the hands and feet to endure the most brutal and demoralizing type of maritime execution, keel hauling. <laughs> Teach is strung up by a pulley system. Rogers takes his time, letting him hover over the water. Then he drops him under the surface, takes a long pause, holding him under the water. Then he gives a command for Teach to be dragged slowly by the cable along the bottom of the jagged, barnacle-crusted underside of the ship, and finally returned to the other side. It's important to know, I think, the contrast between black sails and the real life history behind these people. The real Blackbeard is often remembered very much as he is written and portrayed in this series. I think we all have this image of him. In this he is portrayed as a legendary, frightening, majestic archetype of this romanticized 18th century pirate. Hell, if you ever hear the word pirate, Blackbeard is probably the image you think of. And if you don't think of Blackbeard, you probably think of how Robert Louis Stevenson described Long John Silver. The real Blackbeard. <laughs> the real Blackbeard, however, was more like Jack Sparrow, which is to say capable of being brilliant, charismatic, and distinctive in his own way, but also very strange and silly and drunken and a womanizer and a terminal embarrassment to his own men. Also, he smelled really bad because he never bathed. <laughs> oh no. The version of Edward Teach we see in Black Sails is definitely of the more mythic sort. He's the daddy in every sense of the word. He isn't always right about everything, but he commands respect and admiration through his deeds and his values, even if those values are a bit outdated. And it is because of all this that Rogers has reason to keelhaul. In many ways, Blackbeard represents the beating heart of the Pirate Republic, not only because he was instrumental in its founding, but because of the legend that is Blackbeard. This scene is long, full of pregnant silence. 
the agony and torture is drawn out, and we and this crew of pirates, including Teach's closest remaining allies, are forced to stand still and watch and listen as their legend is slowly, slowly killed, as this great, imposing, self-identified lion of a man is mutilated. This is what Rogers wants to demoralize the pirates. And he starts with their king, with their inspiration, and he crushes him. But I I think there is also a more pressing motivation for the torture Rogers inflicts on the pirate, which is more fundamental to his aims. And ironically, it's also what leads him to underestimate former reason, the spite and bile at the heart of colonialism, all forms of colonialism. Prior to the keelhauling scene, we're shown a flashback of to before when Rogers departed NASA. He is speaking with Captain Berenger, the most accurate representation of of a cop I have ever seen in a piece of fiction. The two of them are discussing their motivation, why their lies and brutal actions are necessary in their eyes. What's been particularly unsettling about season four of Black Sails is we are bluntly presented with the agents of colonialism who had only previously been distant in the narrative and are acquainted intimately with not only their philosophy of hatred and dehumanization, but also the personal justifications for their atrocities. Berenger claims he does what he does to protect his family and his men, and this excuses the sadistic satisfaction he takes in being as cruel and unreasonable in his work as he is. Rogers then tells us a story about a time when he captured a Spanish warship, and though the other ships surrendered and he intended to take her peacefully, he suddenly decided instead to torture and kill the entire crew because a stray shot inadvertently killed Roger's brother. He killed everyone on that ship and left but a single survivor to tell the tale. Again and again, we are shown the antagonists of this series reinforce their hatred and dehumanization of their enemy, reinforce it with personal slights and see nothing dishonest in doing so. Cruelty is the point and civilization will justify cruelty in whatever way it can. Rogers drops Teach's limp form onto the deck and it seems lifeless. Calmly but sadistically he orders for Jack to be the next but then <laughs> Teach isn't dead, and Rogers isn't bothered. He's not even annoyed yet. If anything, he just relishes the opportunity to whittle down the legendary Blackbeard to even less. Again. And it happens again. <laughs> The mood of the assembly grows even more dire as we witness even more drawn out brutality and the pathetic bloody husk of Edward Teach hit the deck again. Roger seems pleased with the result, but then Teach is still not dead. Again! Again? Rogers isn't as easy about the state of affairs as he was, and the crowd of pirates, though still horrified, are looking now with curiosity. And Jack Rackham has locked eyes with Rogers. His expression isn't merely a full of loathing, but a surprised kind of defiance is dawning on his face. Teach hits the deck once more, and he seems truly dead. Rogers finally looks relieved and satisfied. They go to move on, but... Teach isn't just alive. Though his body and face are ruined beyond compare, he is struggling to stand. He glares pitifully but purposefully at Woods Rogers. And Rogers looks from Teach to Jack to the pirates, and his satisfaction is soured. And as he stalks over to shoot what remains of Blackbeard in the head, he knows he's failed. He looks at the faces 
of the pirates who once worshipped Edward Teach at the men who defied an entire empire to pursue their own justice. He sees he hasn't broken them. He's given them a martyr and he's reminded them why they fight. Not only is Roger's sadism and vindictive nature deflated by this act of endurance, but the utility of the cruelty he was employing, the deliberate cruelty wrapped up in the trappings of law and order is undermined and made a mockery of. It did not have the power he intended. This scene I think represents a lot about Black Sails as a story, about its political and sociological struggles, and by extension perfectly represents the character of its villain. Woods Rogers represents the cruelty and hypocrisy of colonizing empires to a T. And this scene also perfectly encapsulates his true face as a person. He is a man with utmost conviction in his aims and will only be stopped by utter annihilation. But meanwhile, he pays lip service to the rules, to honor, to the law, but ultimately will break and circumvent them rather than negotiate or compromise in any way. Like the empire he serves, like every empire, he clothes the authoritarian will and conformity in righteousness and morality. And I think what's even more poignant is he represents, especially in this scene, the limits of that power. A theme that is echoed in events that transpire in the rest of the season as colonies and slave plantations revolt against the empire. Rogers and the British Empire were trained only to deal with defiance by crushing or corralling. They do this to exert control and instill fear. But at a certain point, open, widespread violence and oppression by the oppressor loses its impact. When you wage open war on your own people, you remind them you are their enemy. And unequal society only works when people don't pay attention to the inequality. And when the people see resistance, they too are emboldened to resist. Black Sails needed a villain that was as contemptible and deluded, intimidating, and two-faced as the political forces it was critiquing. And in this scene, Woods Rogers proved beyond a doubt that he is that villain. Thank you all again for listening. I hope you enjoyed this. Anyone who's here for the One Villainous Scene videos, I hope it was insightful. I hope it inspired you to go out and watch Black Sails because you really should. It's a really excellent show. It's honestly just one of these stories that's been slept on for far too long and it deserves the cred. Go watch Rowan Ellis's video. I hope you liked this video. Nando V Movies is doing this great series, One Villainous Scene. I hope to be part of other challenges in the future. Black Sails is just a great show. I cannot stress enough how little I have described about this show. There is so much to enjoy about it. This is just, this is literally just one very isolated scene. I've tried to give it as much context as I could, but it is a fantastic series that has so much more to it, to its other characters and their dynamics and their journeys. Not just political stuff, but great character work. It's just so good. I mean, it's obviously not like flawless or anything, but it's so well written. I'm probably gonna take a break from it for a while because I've watched it like three times, three and a half times now. But I just wanted to share my appreciation for it today. And I thought one villainous scene was also a great time to do it because this fucking scene is one of the hardest to watch and it's one of the best in the whole series, but there are so many great other ones. There are plenty of other good villains in the show, but I also appreciate it's a show where people are genuinely complex. Not everyone is as straightforwardly good or bad. Most characters are very complicated and their motivations will change. A lot of people are right about some things or wrong about other things, and it's, it's a dynamic. It's the kind of writing I wish I could see more of, where things are complex, but it has a clear goal and a clear theme in mind. Um, so I hope uh, you'll take my advice and try and go watch it. It's definitely worth it. Until then, you're old enough to drink, aren't you? As always, before I have a Patreon, I would love if you could become subscribers of this channel as well. But if you, if you would like to become patrons, that would be amazing as well. Any little bit of support helps. If not for the money, it would just be great to know I had people supporting me. I hope you have enjoyed. Our little, little mini episode. Stay cool, 
Stay safe and drink up. Me hearties. Yo ho.